Hello, everyone. Welcome to Critica NYC today. My name is Raquel Batista, and I'm your host. And today, um, I have the pleasure of having two wonderful, strong, powerful Latina women uh, joining us to discuss uh, the state of New York State and New York City from a Latina perspective. Uh, we'll be discussing um, the upcoming presidential election in November, uh, citizenship, early voting, absentee ballots, um, and all that we kind of really need to keep at the front of our minds as we're approaching um, the elections. So first I'd like to introduce to you, uh, we have Julissa Ferreras Copeland, she is a political commentator, consultant, and former New York City Council member of District 21 in Queens. And we also have uh, Jessica Gonzalez Rojas, who is the Democratic uh, and Working Families Party nominee for the New York State Assembly District 34. Welcome, ladies. Good to be here. Great to be here, Hecken. Thank you. No, thank you. Uh, so we're here today, um, you know, we, we took some time uh, for Kritika to really plan out um, our fall season. Today, September 15th, tomorrow is actually going to be the first official day back for all of our public school students in the New York City Department of Education. Um, they'll be remote tomorrow. And then it is planned for them to return uh, for those who are doing blended learning and going in person um, next week. So, you know, I just want to open it up to both of you to just give us, you know, what is your perspective um, as we're stepping into the fall now? Um, we've been through the coronavirus pandemic now for six months, right? We in New York City, the schools shut down. The decision was made on March 15th, March 16th, around this time. Um, and, you know, I would just love to hear from you what your experiences have been so far and what are your thoughts on the political landscape. Uh, would love to start with Julissa. Well, again, thank you, Raquel. Happy uh, Hispanic Heritage Month. I thought this was very poignant that we kicked this off in this way. So I thank you for this opportunity and for providing this platform for us as Latinas to be able to share our experiences. Um, uh, it is no secret that I left the city council two years ago. Um, and shortly after my decision, I moved to Australia and I spent two years in Australia. So my perspective is a little, um, it's a little different because I also got an opportunity to see how a completely different country did this, the whole COVID. Um, and, you know, they did a lot of things correctly. And, you know, I, I would have hoped that here in the States were able to kind of uh, had led in that way. But the reality is that the you, we needed the partnership of a broad federal support that the United States did not have. Um, and in watching from afar and watching New York, and it was one of the reasons why I came back, um, watching that New York in many ways was doing a lot of what they were doing on their own, kind of on an island. Um, one of the things that uh, happened prior to me coming was the opening of schools because the Australian government understood that they needed to open schools safely so that people can go back to work. And I think it is um, one of the most challenging things for anyone, a family or even a single mom or anyone to be able to say, I'm going to homeschool is a luxury in some of our cases. And especially when we have so many essential workers in our communities. Um, so it is vital that this school schooling situation is handled properly, right? But it has to be tied to being able, you know, if we want to open up an economy again and we want to get people back to work and commuters back into Manhattan, then we must be able to make families and uh, feel safe and know that they will be safe when they go back to school. Thank you, Julissa. Jessica. 
So I'm a parent of a nine-year-old who's a rising fourth grader. And, you know, when, when the, the mayor made the decision um, in March to close schools, I was really grateful that they did and also sad, right? Because it's really hard for um, our students to have been sort of pulled out of that situation and have to navigate the rest of the year um, remotely. Um, but it was the right thing to do. And quite frankly, I think they acted a little bit too late because at that point, um, I think Broadway was closing, the NBA had been called off, right? So there was a lot of things that were already being shut down and schools were almost that last decision. Um, and I think that actually caused some delays in, in, in ways that we could have prevented um, the outbreak from expanding as much as it did. This community that I actually shared with you, Lisa, um, Jackson Heights, East Elmhurst, Corona, Woodside, became the epicenter of the epicenter. I just got to see uh, do a tour of Elmhurst Hospital and they share that they were the only facility that was open for COVID testing. So we saw the lines wrapped around uh, the building and you know many of our families here suffered. We had uh, such high rates of COVID, we had high rates of deaths and a community that is rich in diversity, rich in um, immigration, um, we saw a lot of our, our, our family members and community members pass away in this moment. So it was really, really hard. Um, and again, quite frankly, I think we should have closed schools earlier. We're now in a predicament that parents are actually choosing between putting their kids in a blended learning program, which is essentially one or two days a week in the facility um, or keeping them home. And as Julissa mentioned, not everyone has a luxury to keep their child home. But I actually um, made a statement recently and um, said that we really need to invest in remote learning and this idea of putting students in, quite frankly, harm's way in this moment is gonna be detrimental for, two, for one or two days a week, which doesn't even provide the security that many families need who are working families, single mothers, um, to have their children in a safe space and cared for during the day. Uh, my son's school right here in Jackson Heights, they have rotating days. So there's not even a way to really plan. So you might be group A, which on one week comes in a Monday and a Wednesday, and then next week it's Tuesday and Thursday. And that makes it really, really, really difficult for working families to be able to plan and coordinate um, drop off and pick up and, and ensure that their kids are, are remaining safe. So I actually think it's, um, it, it's not a smart move right now to have everyone come together. Um, there's a school in our district, IS-230, that already had a confirmed case of COVID amongst one of the teachers. And many of the teachers are, are outside. They don't feel safe going into the classroom. So they're actually doing their planning and, 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 and preparation outside in this moment. So I'm deeply concerned about what this means, bringing all these students into the schools when the schools are, their, their funding is being cut. Um, they don't have the resources they need. Um, I heard like schools got their thermometers, but then they didn't get batteries, right? So there's like all these challenges that the administration is facing to prepare our, our schools and the facilities. Um, and quite frankly, I think we're putting our students in harm way. So I personally chose to um, have my child in remote or, or, uh, only, but I really sympathize with the families that really feel that they have to have their children um, in the schools because of, of work obligations. But I, I don't think we're ready and I'm really concerned that we're gonna see a second wave very quickly. And I just wanted to add that one of the reasons why we are also in this position is because we have not addressed overcrowding in our schools. Yeah. Right, because if we had right-sized classrooms, we wouldn't have to be on this alternating day. So the alternating day has nothing to do with COVID and, and it, just on its own. It's the fact that you can have the social distancing, the proper social distancing in our classrooms. So, you know, it is really frustrating um, to see us in this position when we should have been addressing the overcrowding uh, many, many, many years ago. And perhaps as a city, we wouldn't be where we are now, um, or we would be addressing it in a different way. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with you on that, Julissa. I definitely see that a lot of the issues that we've been seeing for decades, right, are now being exacerbated by this pandemic at this point. And, you know, then we're also going to be dealing with the future of the fact that 
Um, in the next year, we're going to be having a whole new administration, right? We're going to have a new mayor. Half the city council will also be new. They're going to be inheriting um, a whole big mess, right, after, after this pandemic. I definitely would love to hear your thoughts from both of you. Um, and I would love to start with Jessica, especially now, you know, we're going into the election, you're the nominee for the New York State Assembly District 34 and congratulations again on that. Um, and, you know, there has been a lot of political movement in Queens, um, a lot of new fresh blood, a lot of progressive Latinas coming to, to take leadership to really tackle these issues. You know, I would love to hear from you. Um, how do you see the, the near future on these issues? I think this moment is really exciting. Um, I have to say our district is on fire, right? Like in a positive way, right? We saw in 2018, we saw the election of uh, a, a neighboring, my neighboring district, uh, the election of a, a young dreamer, right? A dynamic Latina named Carolina Cruz, who was elected to the 39th district, which is neighboring to our district. And we share a lot of the same communities. Um, we also saw a state senator, another fierce Latina, Jessica Ramos, be elected to the state Senate. Um, and then I'm the home of uh, Ocasio, uh, Alessandra Ocasio-Cortez, our fierce Congresswoman. Um, so Latinas are doing our thing in this district and it's really exciting. And, and part of the inspiration that uh, allowed me to raise my hand is seeing how the election of these really strong, bold women actually changed the conversation, right? And I, and I would say like, Julissa, you were on the forefront of that leadership and seeing how your leadership has inspired so many others to raise their hand and get involved in our communities. It's also seeing this next wave of leaders who are stepping up and speaking out and we're seeing things pass because they're now at the table. So, you know, we just passed a green light bill uh, last year that allows for undocumented folks to be able to get licenses. And it's because we have a dreamer at the table, right? And it's because we have a different voice and people who are from communities that are most impacted by the policies that are being passed. So the stale mail and pale is sort of done with, <laughs> at least in this community. And I think what's exciting about the upcoming city council races, I would argue that every single district, right, is up for reelection. I know there's some that are turned out, but every single person um, may face a race because you know no nobody seats is guaranteed um, and everyone has to rerun. So uh, if the seat is not already vacant um, in terms of, of being turned out, um, and we're seeing a really dynamic uh, group of folks who are um, stepping up and raising their hands. I'm seeing many, many people of color, many women of color, we're seeing uh, folks with disabilities, we're seeing trans people, we're seeing, you know, uh, you know, immigrants who are now naturalized US citizens stepping up and running. So it's a really exciting dynamic. I think quite frankly, what's going to be hard is that we're going to see really amazing people run against each other, right? Uh, but um, the city just voted to have ranked choice voting, which allows you instead of having to choose one person, you sort of rank them. So you say, my first choice is X, my second choice is X numero dos, right? So you get to rank the candidates. So I hope that that uh, provides for a more civil discussion, right? It won't be as um, combative as many other elections have. We don't know, we'll see. Um, but it does allow people to say, hey, well, I like these two people. Um, I like this one a little bit more, but this person's not bad. I'd be happy with them and allows them to rank um, their votes. So it's going to be a really interesting race, not just because we have so many people running and so many new voices and progressive voices running, but we also and seeing a whole different way of voting that's going to be, you know, really interesting to watch and see the outcome of, of that race of all these races. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a lot of changes coming up when it comes to voting and the way people are going to be able to participate, right? Because um, uh, we're going to be continuing to have absentee voting mm -hmm. and people can go on to, there's a website, www.ny.gov, I know for sure, has um, a button where you can press and request your absentee ballot. 
but as well, we'll be having early voting, which will begin on October 24th and will go through November 1st for the November 3rd election. So, um, you know, that's definitely things that I think every person should really keep in mind. And as Julissa had mentioned, uh, while we were um, preparing for this, everyone, you know, should have a voting plan. Um, so Julissa, you know, I definitely, you know, would love to hear more on your thoughts on, you know, how you see, you know, the future of electoral politics in New York City and New York State. Um, but definitely if you can, you know, also talk about, you know, one of the very important things that elected officials do is consider the budget, right? They consider the New York City Council, um, consider the budget at the council level um, and at the state level, um, the assembly and the Senate together with the governor also consider the budget, right? And we, we've we heard a lot about, uh, you know, having to make a lot of adjustments and a lot of budget cuts. Um, what is this going to look like, right? Uh, you know, because of the pandemic and all the issues that we're seeing. Well, I think, you know, um, first off, I'm so excited that we have so much excitement and true empowerment happening in what was my own district and in the surrounding area. Um, I think we're sending very dynamic, smart, talented women um, to be able to face the challenges. And the reality that the challenges are real. And they're real on multiple levels, right? Because the last time we saw the recession, um, which for some of us was a depression, um, but the last time that we saw the recession, it wasn't as um, global in the sense that it didn't affect everyone. Like COVID has affected everyone in every way, in different ways. Um, very few people have actually benefited from COVID. I think technology is the only one, that, you know, tech work is the only one that actually has um, strengthened in this, in this time than Amazon probably. Um, but uh, the reality is moving forward. Um, this has been, there's been certain elements that have been a long time in the making from 2000, um, eight to 2018, we lost 1.3 million residents in New York City and state. And that's really a big number, especially when we're talking about congressional seats and representation. And unfortunately, I think, you know, while every one of our advocates and everybody's working on the census, I think the fact that the federal government has not really made it a priority and actually has found ways to discourage the process and confuse the process and take money and time away from the process and have us all waste our time on this. Um, and then you add in COVID, I'm very concerned about what our numbers will be for New York um, when all this is said and done. Um, when it comes to the budget, look, the reality is that New York City really counts on tourism, it counts on real estate, it counts on um, generating these tax dollars that help us pay these bills, right? It takes a lot of money to run New York City. And one of the, the, the biggest anxieties that I see moving forward is also the safety net nonprofit organizations, what this impact will mean for them, um, what will how will the, the safety nets he, be able to make up if there are these huge budget cuts and what programs that are currently serving our communities will no longer be in existence. And this is something that's very real. And a lot of our nonprofits are um, held um, together by philanthropy. And you know, will philanthropy still be giving in the way that it gives? Will the priority shift? Um, so these are really, really big economic questions that we need to have answered. And you know, the biggest of this is the small businesses. You know, our small businesses are what makes our streets safe, right? When I used to get off the 7 train and walk up Junction Boulevard and walk down 34th Avenue or any of these dark streets, it was the small businesses that kept their lights on because they were on, you know, till 10 o'clock and, you know, made the safe, the communities feel like what they are, communities, and made our streets main streets. But if we're not supporting our small businesses in the way that they need to be supported, we're going to have a really, really big um, fiscal hole that we're going to have to fill. While I was the finance chair, we really focused on, and I even got a lot of pushback for pleading for us to put money in the reserves for a rainy day. Unfortunately, the rainy day now is not even a day. It's been like a rainy six months. Um, 
So while the reserves may have helped some, um, the bill is gonna come due and I don't think that we're gonna have the revenue to make up for that difference. In 2008 and in the, in the years moving forward, we have Obama in office who you know, is able to focus in and deliver on the ARA funding that really kept us all the way almost to 2014. We had some of that funding, especially when it came to Sandy. So there was monies that were coming in from the federal government to help. And even then we had major cuts all through the Bloomberg administration, you know, and we all know them as pegs. Um, and you know, they were they were major, even with the federal government. So when we have a federal government that is turning its back on New York and not wanting to support New York, I think that you know, all of us, you know, all of us New Yorkers and elected officials. We send a lot of money to the federal government and we need to get a portion of that back because um, it is, it's imperative. And that is also, you know, it's not only about electing Latinas and Latinos and, you know, and, and progressives to elected offices. What committees are they going to chair? What committees are they going to sit on, right? We don't want our people just, and look, I'm, I'm speaking as someone who was the chair of Women's Issues Committee and, and in reality, nobody wanted it. But I always say, look, if you, whatever you get, you can make the most of it because from women's issues, I went to finance chair, right? Like that was the transition. So we have to make, work with what we have. However, we also have a very, very uh, big commitment to our communities. So we need to be on the finance committee. We need to be in those budget negotiating um, tables and really have a voice. And I think that's really when we have our, the power of the purse um, for, and, and deliver back to our communities. Yeah, I, I think that what is at least scary to me, right, is the fact that New York has not gotten that real support from the federal government right now, you know, having uh, Trump as president. Um, and we do have this upcoming election in November. And, uh, you know, we have on the Democratic ticket, uh, Biden and Harris um to you know hopefully right i mean i am hopeful uh that um we can win whether it's for those people who are pro democrats or just people who want to vote against trump um how do you see the panorama at this point i mean we we know that new yorkers have traditionally voted blue have voted democrat um but you know, then there's the rest of the country. Um, how do you both see the the current situation? And you know, what are your reflections about the Latino vote? Um, will Latinos come out? Uh, first of all, will there be a high turnout of Latinos to come out and vote? And who will they vote for? I do want to say something about the budget, though. I think it's important to note that there are some people who did benefit from this virus, as, as uh, Julissa mentioned, and it was billionaires. Um, and in fact, we, we, we had 118 billionaires in the beginning of the crisis. And um, as we come, we're not quite out of it, but as the crisis has progressed, we've actually gained more billionaires in New York State. There's now currently 120 billionaires whose collective wealth is over $500 billion. Um, and right now, New York State is facing a $14 billion shortfall on its budget. And there's a very simple solution, which is to tax the billionaires. And this is to ensure in this moment where the federal government is absolutely failing us, that New York State could show up as leaders and ensure that every single person um, in our state is getting the resources that they need to survive and thrive. And unfortunately, we're not seeing that leadership. And that's part of the reason I'm running. You know, right now, we need to ensure that we're um, advancing a moratorium on evictions, right? Look at that, we're canceling rent, that the workers, the essential workers who are on the front lines of this pandemic, um, who have been mostly excluded from some of the federal benefits, such as our undocumented workers, get the relief that they need and deserve um, in this moment. And there's so many issues that we're facing in this moment that the state can step up and lead. And instead we're hearing about a potential additional 20% of budget cuts. So there are solutions at the table. We just really need the political courage to get the revenues that we need and deserve from those who are the most wealthiest and have actually benefited, benefited $77 billion in additional wealth during the period in which we've had COVID. And that's 
and again, it's not over, so that can continue. So I, I just I just want to say that because I feel really strongly about um, taking the taking the opportunities to get the revenues that we can get. There's many proposals on the table, um, and it would like stock you know, transfer taxes and, and, and um, taxing second home of billionaires. And, you know, there's many, many levels of proposals that we can advance to get the revenues that we need to ensure that we're, that all our teachers are getting the, the PPE and, and the supplies that they need. My son's school literally does not have enough teachers for tomorrow when we're literally starting um, the school year. So we're still in dire straits and there's a, a base of revenue that we're not tapping into that I think we should. Um, but to your question about the Latino vote, I think, you know, it, we have so much power as, as the, you know, largest community of color in, the, in this country. Um, and one thing that's really important to note about Latinos, Latinx is that women are in the forefront of um, political engagement and empowerment. Um, Latinas, like other women of color, register and vote in higher numbers than the Latino, their male counterparts, and that you see that across like black women and other women of color. Um, and oftentimes, you know, we have to ensure that our elected officials or, or candidates are actually courting the Latino vote, that they're speaking to Latinas, right? That they're engaging them and inspiring them. And it's, I think it's not enough to just to be anti-Trump. You have to present a vision. Um, so for, with this kind of brutal democratic, um, race that happened, you know, many people are, you know, not as inspired by the Biden-Harris ticket. Um, so many of us are feeling like there's a little bit of a harm reduction moment, but we do need to recognize that there's real opportunity in this ticket to maybe look at what the cabinet could look like, what, um, kind of leadership can happen. Um, in this moment, if we are able to change the, the administration. So, you know, we absolutely have to get rid of Trump. We just heard today that ICE is essentially conducting um, sterilizations of, of immigrant women in detention center. This is, this is like a throwback to the Tuskegee experiment, to the sterilization of, of Puerto Rican women in, in the 40s and 50s, right? They're doing horrific, horrific things. So we must turn out and vote. Right, but the candidates really, really need to speak to us and inspire us because um, it's going to take all of us to get Trump out of office and change the face um, of this country and change the like the, hum the the humanity that's needed to be brought to the table. Like we just need a, a really new vision. And and you know, I'm voting, and I talked about this earlier today. I'm voting on the working families line because the working families line speak to me a, a set of values that the candidates will will. You know, have have committed to striving for. So that's the way I'm voting for Biden and Harris um, because I believe there's a vision there. Um, but we need to ensure that all our communities are engaged. And the other thing I want to mention is that it's not just about um, engaging and reaching out to um, U.S. citizen Latinos. Every single person has a role, right? If you are undocumented, you can make phone calls, you can knock on doors, you can walk your family members to the polls, you can ask people to vote um, in your honor because you are unable to vote. And that is so important. Every single person has an opportunity to engage regardless of the fact of whether or not they can vote because civic engagement is not just about citizens, it's about every single member of this community. Thank you so much for that, Jessica. Julissa, um, you know, just to also bring it back to the issue of creating revenue for the state and for the city and looking at billionaires. Do you think that it's possible for us to really create the political will to get right, uh, you know, whatever it is, a comprehensive tax reform to get the billionaires to give. I think you know, if, if this is not the time, I don't know when is. And you know, this is not a a new or a you know something that's just been created now. We've been talking about this for a long time, even before we needed it at this level, and even before they've greatly benefited. You know, one thing that for a long time during COVID was also growing the gangbusters was Wall Street. Yet, you know, how is the city benefiting from every little share that's sold? There's an opportunity every day that goes by, we leave money on the table. Um, and there's this conception that, oh, they'll leave. They're not gonna go. They're actually buying more, right? If you look at the real estate and, and all the transactions that are happening, people are buying and selling homes everywhere. 
Um, so I think there is a great opportunity. And the, if, if this isn't the moment, I really don't know when the moment is. If it's not now, when, and you know, I, it, what, what else has to happen? Like what will the next crisis be? Uh, it is absolutely ridiculous that um, I would think that we wouldn't uh, have this already in the pipeline to vote out. Um, because we're going to need it. There's just no way that we're going to be able to make up for that difference. Um, and I just wanted to say uh, to the question on uh, Latino voters, I think what I am 100% supporting Biden, I'm going to do everything that I can for the Biden-Harris ticket. I think, you know, seeing a woman of color is huge for us. While, you know, I love that we have President Obama and his beautiful, perfect family. The reality is that having a woman there, I think will bring a whole new perspective and one that we urgently need, especially one that is um, South Asian, right? Like there's so many, so much that's so special and about her experience. And, you know, and, and the reality is that Biden was there in our last crisis, he was there and we were able to get out of it. And you know it's going to be difficult. They're going to be very, very hard decisions to be made um, for this council, for this next mayor, for you know the state, and and all of our wonderful representatives that we're sending up. Um, the state has a different dynamic, right? Because they have to deal with the Republicans, and thank God there's majorities in both houses right now. But the reality is that that voice is still there, um, and I think that. One thing that we cannot overlook is that Latinos can no longer be considered this voting base that turns out when you say, hola, mi nombre es, right? Like that is no longer gonna fly. One thing that we are proving is that we are a complex voting base. We are not all, you know, we have an evangelical component that just because you're evangelical does not mean that you're automatically voting for Trump. But Trump has been courting that group incessantly right so there are evangelical groups that are saying i want to feel connected to biden but i need him to speak to me um and i need to know that i have a place within the democratic party there are latinos where immigration is not the number one issue where it's education right of their children where it's small businesses where it's entrepreneurship so one thing that we are we are showing as you know as we go through these and become a matured voting block right um, is that we are as dynamic and diverse as we are in, in the countries that represent us. And we all come with different experiences. I think for the Venezolanos, when the Republicans blow the whistle of like communism and that you know, they're gonna be communists, that means something, that resonates something because of their experience. But it is up to us as Latino leaders to say, Eperense, like, you know, this is not, we can't, you can't just believe this blindly. And I also think, unfortunately, that social media has really fed a lot of this misinformation. And we need to be able to have authentic leaders speak um, about what Biden and Harris will do. And, you know, I would hope that the campaign is kind of stepping up their game. And it seems that they are. Um, I've been speaking with a couple of people over there um, and looking at, you know, the, the new Latino buys. So they're buying. Um, uh, or investing more in our people, but eso, hola amigo, como esta, that's not gonna fly anymore as we, as we become more mature, more empowered voters. I mean, Julissa, you definitely brought up a lot of issues that I've been thinking about, especially over the last week. I had this interesting conversation um, last week with a Latina contributor for Fox News uh, she's definitely a spokesperson for the Republican Party. And, you know, she was kind of, she had like these words, these key words that, you know, like just brings up a lot of emotions for Latinos, everything from like Marxism, socialism, and, you know, things that, you know, I know are really inaccurate, right? right? And um, being able to respond to her in a, in a way that it's like, okay, well, let's really think about what you're saying, right? And, and, you know, Latinos are, and it's true, we're not monolithic. We are very diverse. We have a lot of different things that interest us, right? We have folks like, I think all three of us, we're all second generation Latinas, right? Our parents are the ones who had the real immigration journey, 
right? And then there are Latinos in this country who are fifth, sixth, seventh generation, that they've been here for a very, very long time and have a very different experience. Um, and so, you know, it's hard to really say, how can we have this conversation in a way that really advances our issues, that is inclusive, and that, you know, basically assures that, you know, that, that we're at the table. You well, know, I think I Jessica, th Jessica hit it on the head though, right? It's about, you have to start engaging us. The fact that we're even having these conversations with less than 50 days out is alarming, right? Why is it that the Latino strategy all of a sudden, for both parties really, but the Latino strategy, strategy gets kicked up, you know, 40 days out. Um, we should be the, part of the strategy from the beginning. And, you know, and I think that is what is so important. But get, don't get me, you know, there is no way that Latinos benefit in a Trump administration. And he's proved that in the last four years and we cannot have him there. So at this point, it's like, whatever motivates you, if it's voting against Trump, voting for Biden, voting for Harris, voting for, you know, just, I need you to go vote and vote, you know, in the Democratic Party. And we need to get responsible, aware, sensitive, human, like, uh, people that are going to actually care that don't put children in cages, right? Like that's who we need in the White House right now, urgently. Yes. And Jessica, you did bring up uh, the latest issue of what's happening in the Georgia detention center of the women who have been, there have been mass sterilizations happening um, in the detention center. And, you know, when, when I saw the article yesterday, a lot of people were like, oh my God, is this true? Is this true? And then I watched the press conference that the groups had today. And yes, it is a, a reality that's happening in the South, right? Um, and, you know, and that's kind of part of the complexity of when you talk about la the Latino vote. I think there really is a there is a different experience that occurs of what's happening in New York versus what may be happening um, in the rest of the country. Um, and Jessica, I would love to hear, you know, a little bit of your thoughts about that because I know you have extensive experience having been the former executive director of the National Latina Institute for Reproductive Health um, on, on these issues and working in these very diverse communities. Yeah, we've been, I've been at the National Latina Institute for Reproductive Health. Now it's called the National Latina Institute for Reproductive Justice, which I love, and I had advocated for that change um, for the last 13 years. And that actually drives a lot of my activism and organizing and policy advocacy work that I've done. And the one thing we've always said is that it's not enough to fight for abortion access or reproductive rights, right? Because when you are a woman of color when you are facing discrimination and racism and xenophobia and lack of access to health care. That right to an abortion or that right to even have a family is taken from you because of these other factors. So the, the, the frame that we organize under is reproductive justice, which addresses all the underlying factors that impacts a person's ability to determine if, when, and how to create a family and then be able to raise that family with dignity. So this is such a, a clear reproductive justice issue because they are robbing people of the ability to create a family, right? And when you're when ICE is tearing families apart, like literally taking children out of, out of the hands of family members, then they are robbing someone of the ability to raise their family with dignity. Right? And we could look at that with the criminal justice system and the way that our, our black and brown brothers and sisters have been gunned down. Like if you are a black mama and cannot feel like you can raise your, 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 your son with dignity because they can go out on the street and be murdered by police, like that's a reproductive justice issue. And it's the same thing with ICE. So when I heard this news, I was appalled and angry, but I actually wasn't surprised because this is a pattern of control over women's bodies, over people who can be pregnant bodies, right? That, that the US has done over, over 
its entire existence. Um, and we've seen this, and I don't want to get too professory. I used to teach a uh, topic on, on reproductive justice at um, NYU and CUNY, but you know these are these are practices that we've seen over the years that have targeted low income. Uh, people of color and um, women of color and, and trans communities and immigrant populations, right? To, to control the population and who is a US citizen in, in this country. So it's, you know, I have so much emotion over this issue because it's been, it's been my fight um, and specifically the intersection of reproductive justice and immigration and the way that the immigration system actually deny and rob our communities of their ability to raise you know, have families or not have families and raise those families with dignity. So it is infuriating. And again, it, it, it also speaks to the urgency of why we need to take these, quite frankly, monsters out of office because the inhumane way in which they're treating people is just, it's, it's immoral, it's evil. Like that, I don't think there's enough adjectives to explain that. Um, but what they've done, they've created a narrative uh, where our community, right, the Latino, Latinx community is not considered human. And when you dehumanize somebody, it is easy to treat them the way that we've been treated. And if you remember when Trump announced his presidency or his candidacy for president, the first thing he did was say that Mexicans and, you know, code for all Latinos are, you know, rapists, criminals, and drug dealers. And that was his, you know, basically his speech um, announcing his candidacy. And he's, he's, you know, he's done well on his promise to, to treat us um, and deport us and, and, and rob us of our ability to, to survive and thrive in this country. So it is, it is so urgent for us to, to step up and vote. And again, I urge our candidates to make sure that they're reaching our communities because we, you know, while we, there's an urgent need to vote, we also need to it has to be accessible, right? Like we're seeing Trump attack the very system of voting um, to make it more and more difficult. So we have to ensure that we're doing what we can to make sure that people are educated, that uh, materials are in the languages that we speak and that we um, need to utilize and that the system is uh, as barrier free as possible in this moment. Thank you, Jessica. Yes, I think, you know, I was equally appalled you know, at the situation in the detention center. Um, a few years ago, I had served on the board of Planned Parenthood in New mm -hmm. York City. And, um, you know, I have very deep belief in the value of a woman's right to choose um, what she does with her body. And the fact that this is happening without the consent of the women. Mm -hmm. And, you know, re yes, robbing them of the ability to have a family, but essentially stopping them from potentially having U.S. citizen children, mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, that's like basically what they're trying to stop from happening. Mm -hmm. um, and that is just... I, it's true. You I, can't really put words to it, but go ahead, Julie. I also think that, you know, there, that, that we need to applaud the nurse, right? The whistleblower mm. um, that she came out because this, we would have never known this. This yeah. is something that has been happening for a probably much longer than we know um, that she came out um, and I wish more people would. These are private um, for-profit um, clinics and agencies and doctors and, you know, that are getting these contracts in the South to do this macabre, right? Because this is something, these are women that we're going for either pain or, or complaining of something to get care and they come out with a hysterectomy, right? Like there's such a disconnect. The fact that, you know, there were no COVID testing, right? Like she, she blew the whistle on many things and this was the most egregious and, and diabolical of all of them. But I think that, you know, uh, we need more people like her to be able to inform and really say what's happening because we really have no idea. There's so much secrecy in these detention centers and total confusion. And you, Raquel, as an attorney, you know, and, and all of us, right? We have experience on, on people being detained and thrown in detention centers and sent out to Texas and you don't know how long they're gonna be there, when they're gonna get back. Um, and, you know, if they're gonna get deported or not the conditions are deplorable. So I think that it's about time that we have more Americans 
that are working for these for-profit companies to come out and say what really is happening out there so that we can defend um, just humankind and, and give people an opportunity because to come to this country and to have um, the opportunity to, ex to have a family ripped out of you because you wanted a better life is that is just the most inhumane, horrific thing that any woman can go through. Um, and honestly, they're part of a crime, I think. I think this should put them in the process of citizenship because, you know, when we have victims of a crime in this country, there is a process and a, and a lineage to be able to get your residency. And any of these women that are identified, I believe, you know, I'm not the attorney here, um, but I believe they should have a path to actual permanent residency. Yes, Julissa, and that's a, a great segue um, for us to talk a little bit now about citizenship, right? Um, even though, you know, we've been talking a lot about, uh, you know, participation in the upcoming elections, and a lot of this conversation, you know, is for the voter, right? And as Jessica had mentioned, there's a lot of people who may not be registered to vote or uh, whether because they're a young person or they're undocumented, but they're ready to participate and to be out there. But then we do have a lot of people out there who want to become a U.S. citizen. Um, and unfortunately, the fees for citizenship are going to be going up in October. Um, Julissa, you'd like to discuss that a bit? Yeah, we, uh, Raquel and I talked about this earlier, you know, I'm just so incredibly disappointed that we have so many fires that we're fighting as a community at this moment, that this one is one that's so important and needs to be valued. Um, <laughs> sorry. I know. I have my own fire here. Um, <laughs> so I think that it's important that we take this window right now from now to October 1st, which is a very, very small window to get as many of our, of our people to qu that qualify um, five years of permanent residency um, to, or if you, three years. And if you've been married to an American citizen, you can do your citizenship in three years um, at $725. Uh, when I started this advocacy work with Naleo when I was like 16 years old, the application was $95, um, and I'm not that old. Um, so the fact that we're at $1,200, I think it's just, it's like a tax, right? It's a tax again on our people. It's any way that um, this administration can discourage people from becoming citizens. I remember there was a time where if you actually applied just before presidential election, the applications would be processed faster. You know, there was like this window, there was like a sweet spot um, where you wouldn't have to wait as long for the application because it is said that whoever was the president when you became a citizen, you probably were gonna vote for them as a naturalized uh, citizen. This administration has completely done the opposite. Not only are they discouraging people and, you know, from becoming United States citizens, but they've actively made it cost prohibitive for many of our families, $1,200, um, with an added component of COVID, um, with all the other complexities that we have that we're facing in our homes, um, is just uh, completely unaffordable. So any, I urge anyone, I'm sure you can reach out to Naleo, to the Hispanic Federation, um, to Jessica on her uh, website, Jessica Gonzalez Rojas, um, who has a wealth of resources. Um, I'm sure you will also do the record. Anybody, please reach out and become a citizen, um, just like we mobilize our voting base, we really need to get, it's no longer acceptable that we have residents that have been public, uh, uh, permanent residents for 20 years, you know, so Ciudadano, right? Like we, you're going, you're a part of this community. We need Absolutely. you, we need your vote and we need you to become naturalized. No, uh, and, and I, I wanna like just chime in on that because my mom, who came to this country when she was 12, uh, did not apply for her citizenship, I think, until she turned, when she turned 50. Yeah. I mean, you know, and it was because I was like, you need to do it if you don't do it. And at the time, I was the executive director of the Northern Manhattan Coalition for Immigrant Rights. And I'm like, you can't be running around here without your citizenship. Um, and, you know, she finally did it. So, 
you know, I definitely want to encourage folks, especially if you're, you're viewing this and you know that your parents or there's someone who older in your family who should be doing and completing their citizenship, please, you know, assist them and um, we'll make sure to, you know, get information out there. Jessica, do you want to add anything on that, on things that may be happening locally in Queens? I mean, I just want to add the, the shared experience of, of my father coming to this country from Paraguay in 1969 and didn't become a U.S. citizen until 2001. And I remember panicking because he was going through the process for so long that, and this is another way in which they made it really complicated and difficult for you know, folks to naturalize because, you know, you get your fingerprints taken and then the process is dragging out and then your fingerprints expire and then you have to pay for another set of fingerprints and then you have to do the test again. And then, you, you know, God forbid you have one question wrong on the citizenship test, they could, you know, make you take it again. And, and you know, the, the, the struggle that it takes to actually become a citizen, it is not as simple as like, oh, get in line, you know, you hear that, that rhetoric, it, it is a lot of work. And as Julissa mentioned, it is expensive and getting ridiculously and, and abhorrently expensive. And I totally agree. We need to really push our community if they can in this moment to please um, start the process um, or expect, expedite the process. Um, and I remember when my dad finally was able to get a citizenship in 2001, it happened like just shortly after 9-11. And I was panicking because I thought they were also going to you know, delay that process because of 9-11. And, and thankfully he was able to get naturalized. And let me tell you, our naturalized citizens, they vote. Yes. They, they understand what it's like to, you know, not be respected, not to be heard, not to have a voice, right, in those ways. And, and, and they're the ones who are turning out um, to vote. So amongst the Latino community, naturalized citizens have some of the highest voting rates in our communities. And, you know, for those of us who are born here, we need to sort of honor that, right? Like, I'm also, my father, again, is, is from Paraguay. He came here at 16. You know, I'm, I'm this first generation in this country. And I have to remember all the work and struggle that our families went through to create the life that we have. Um, and voting is part of that legacy, right? And we have to sort of honor that um, and, and, and fight to continue to invest in the future of this country by contributing in that way. So vote, vote, vote. And please, if you're not yet a U.S. citizen, I, I I'm completely aligned with Julissa that we need to make sure that we're doing everything in our power to get folks um, in that pipeline right now. And, and I just wanted to add on the other extreme of voting, right, is those that have the birthright of voting. And because our children are not in high school and they're not attending colleges, a lot of colleges did a lot of voter registration around elections, especially presidential elections. And we have so many young people that are not on campuses right now. Mm -hmm. um, that are not that don't have access for voter registration. And I know that um, different states have different um, cutoff points for for registering to vote. But I think as we look for the unnaturalized people that we need to help become citizens, we also got to turn around and look at our young people that you know maybe would have gotten their license and filled out their their, their voter registration card, and they're not doing that right now, right? Or not in a ca college campus to be readily registered or in high school on their way to graduation. So these social opportunities that we would have had in the past, I remember when we would go door to door, you would stick a voter registration card under your clipboard in case you came across somebody, and you know and you gave them the voter registration card because you it was active. Um, an active way of having people participate in the process. Now, with all those dynamics being pulled out, you know, it it really does um, alarm me that we probably have, I would think, in this presidential year, probably the lowest uh, newly registered voters um, because we don't have all those campaigns of engagement. Sure. So we have um, a few more minutes before we have to, while you know, we wrap up. Um, Let's talk just briefly, you know, if you can, if you guys can just say, why is it important? I mean, we've been talking about why it's important, but why is it really truly important to come out and vote, especially for those people who are on the fence and who feel like their vote may not count or it doesn't matter. Why should they go to the polls, do their absentee ballot and make sure that their vote is counted? Jessica? I'll start by saying, um, I think Tiffany Caban's uh, historic uh, 
candidacy for Queens District Attorney uh, speaks to why every single vote matters. Uh, she came within 55 votes of becoming the next district attorney in Queens. A uh, 31-year-old queer Latina public defender uh, made history uh, as a candidate. And unfortunately, after a long drawn out battle where they had to do a recount, um, it was 55 votes. Um, and that's just like a building <laughs> um, in, in Jackson Heights, right? That's just like a handful of people that could have you know, changed the way in which the criminal justice system is addressed in this county, um, so in this borough. So I, I think it's important to remember that every single vote counts. There was a city council race in Boston between two Latinas actually, where the deciding factor was one, <laughs> one vote, right? So could you imagine that one other person who stayed home and could have changed the dynamics of that race. It, it is really, really critical. And what I would argue too, and, and I guess, you know, I, I, I'm sure you agree with me, Julissa, as someone who was a city council candidate uh, and a city council member, um, both of us ran for also small political positions back in the day, <laughs> 2002. Um, it is important to look at your local candidates. It is really important to look at the party positions that are before us. It's important to learn about these roles because oftentimes, the more local positions, right, the, the city council, the state assembly, the state senate, even your district leader, those are the, the, the candidates and, and the positions that actually impact us very concretely in your community and, and in, your, in your home um, and in your life. So, you know, those elections, all the elections matter, right? And we're talking about the urgency of, of the presidential election in this moment, but it's also these much smaller positions that can impact the day-to-day -day of your life. So um, vote, vote, vote. November 3rd is the election. Um, and as Julissa mentioned, there's a period of early voting. We do absentee voting. There's we're fighting to ensure that it's more accessible for our community um, and what we just really need um, our folks to engage. Thank you, Jessica. Julissa? Well, you know, ditto to everything that Jessica said, we're kind of cut from the same cloth. Um, <laughs> we're a product of the same area, the same fight. Um, I think that for those people that are on the fence, I'm very confused about the people on the fence, really, um, because I don't understand, like, what else do we need to do? And, you know, I make myself available. Shoot me an email. Reach out to me if you need me to, you know, do some convincing. I will definitely do my best to persuade. Um, we need to get a different person in the White House. But we also need, just as Jessica had mentioned, to pay attention to the down ballots, right? Like when we're looking at our court system and these judges that are in position, you know, do they look like us? Have they been through our experience? Do they understand what we, you know, what it's like to be and grow up in our neighborhoods? I think it's really important that we also look at the judges that are elected, the district leaders, the council members. If you want a pothole fix, you don't call the president of the United States. <laughs> you call your city council member. But also, you know, we have to have and be more engaged on community boards that are making very big decisions in our community, especially when it comes to economic de and, um, development and, um, and building in our communities and the future of our communities. Right in those community board meetings um, from liquor licenses. Um, also, when we talk about police reform, which I believe we completely need a complete overhaul, um, we also need to be present at the precinct council meetings, right? Like a lot of uh, defund the police, I think the, the, the narrative, which is very important, is real and something that we need to do, which is about taking funding and resources and allotting it to things that will help our communities. But the reality is that we also need for the precinct captains to see the face of our community. And they need to, we need to be in their face in those precinct council meetings and say, look, this is the issue we're having. Because defunding the police doesn't mean that we don't want policing, right? Like we still want to be in a safe neighborhood. Um, but one thing doesn't have to do with the other. And I, you know, I know we're talking about voting, but I just feel like it's about civic engagement. We need to be engaged in what's happening in our community and we need to be attacking it from every angle possible. And this will help. How do we help Jessica become a better legislator? We're present. 
We're present where she can't be. And we bring the stories to her, to her office while she's in Albany. Because we want her to be in Albany. I don't want her to be on Junction or Roseville Avenue. I want her to be in Albany fighting for me. So that when she comes back, we're able to report back. And I think the best thing we can do is to vote on November 3rd. And thank you again, Raquel, for this amazing opportunity. All right. Well, ladies, thank you so much. I love that you gave us of your time and energy. Thank you to the Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Thank you to our executive producer, Senaida Mendez, and the staff at Manhattan Neighborhood Network, especially Freddy Pinto for all of your work. Thank you, and please join Critica NYC in two weeks where we'll have two amazing guests. Hope to see you all then. Thank you very much. Hola Rosas. Bye.